everybody burps. F and taxes and everybody burps. Yeah, what I wanted to talk about before I talked about, you know, history of water pollution in Kansas City and some of the, uh, you know, the, the building of the city and all that. What this talk was about was to try and show you how the pipes work. There's a huge infrastructure that sits beneath it, and we don't see a lot of it, or we walk over parts of it and don't really recognize what's there. And so when we talk about why our bills are so high, I wanted to be able to show you through a bunch of pictures and pretty easy on the science, show you how the pipes work, and why is it important, and what could possibly go wrong. Back to the human health thing, basic sanitation is really clear. The package deal of drinking water, clean drinking water, and wastewater treatment is very important to us in terms of health and in terms of uh, biological protection. And they're a package deal. Uh, clean water, uh, drinking water, and sanitation of humans is probably the most important step. But environmentally and for our own health, uh, treatment of water is important. Back to cholera. Why bring up cholera as being so important? That was the big disease that was waterborne that really walked its way through it, really through the planet, and killed thousands and thousands of people, possibly millions. And it was extremely scary disease. When it would come in, you know, people would rapidly dehydrate, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, death in less than a day. Uh, St. Louis was particularly hard hit in the 1850s. Uh, a steamboat broke loose on the river, burning, and it took out 12, 20 other steamboats as well, but it also set the riverfront on fire and burned 400 uh, wood dwellings down. And these were full of people. These weren't single family housing. This was a huge number of people displaced, thousands displaced. And so they went out into the city and were under uh, you know, even poorer sanitation. And so when cholera came, St. Louis lost four to 6,000 people. And that wasn't that big a town at the time. Now that's where the breakthrough came through. And this is kind of some repeat from before, but a doctor named John Snow figured out that it was bacteria that was making people sick. Before that, they thought it was miasma, the terrible smell. And so at that point, when he figured out that a pump was contaminated, using a microscope, by the way, he then f mapped it and figured out to take the handle off the pump. And so by disabling a pump, he may have saved hundreds of people. But this was a, a huge breakthrough in the water pollution game because we actually figured out that bacteria in water make you sick. And so that's the, kind of the scientific side. Now I kind of wanted to switch back and go to just the pure filth of it all. So you see, 19, 1828, they had rough mo microscopes at that point, and the Thames River looked like that through a microscope. Of course, that, you know, a cartoon, but you could see they call it monster soup, and there was a terrible outcry, and it became worse and worse and worse. The rivers of Europe smelled like bad. You, you cannot believe the, the stench, and each summer was especially bad. The rivers would go anaerobic, everything would roll up dead, there was no fishery, and it was pretty ugly. London, Paris, cities like that, it was just unthinkable. And it finally came to its worst in what was called the Great Stink of eight, 1858. And uh, notice the difference between the two pictures. One, it was like, oh, there's all this monster soup, and now they're saying, oh, that's associated with disease. So between you know, just the next 30 years there, they had figured out that disease was important and also the stench was just evil. Uh, parliament closed down, people left town, you know, it was, it was just an amazing thing. And it was, there, you can find tons of cartoons. Look up the great stink and uh, you'll, you'll find both funny and disturbing cartoons. And also that, that kind of created an awareness of sewerage as a beverage. Uh, they were realizing that their pipes were leaky and that they were contaminating their own wells. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you through from the house, down the pipes, to the sewage treatment plant. Just kind of show you how stuff works. So this is an old picture. Here's at a sink and a drain. This one's hooked up wrong. It's not vented properly to the outside and so it can allow sewer gas up into the house. So that was another thing is they started building sewer system. They figured out that they had to have gas escape and that you couldn't wire it into the house or you would have terrible uh, H2S odor as well as methane coming into the house. And so you could, you could blow stuff up. Of course, here's the famous Mr. Thomas Crapper. Thomas actually was the nephew of the queen, Victoria, and he installed the first toilets 
in her house. So when you talk about sitting on the throne, you're not far from the truth. You can still buy these today, and if you want that special little something for that someone you love, there you go. Uh, you can get them from Britain right now. The currency is way down. The pound is down, so you could get one at a steal. Uh, I just like the venerable on the rim. Come on. That is precious. Now, here's some of the stuff we would start to, to look kind of modern. You know, the water closet up on top, and then you've got the, the crapper valve, which was patented. The crapper pole, those cost 70 bucks. And... Uh, the whole unit, which is very popular with the steampunk crowd right now. So you can still buy it. It's about $2,500 for the whole setup. And I'm sure there's a value-added tax shipping that out of Britain. I want one, just saying. Now, here's, here's the new toilets, just like you would have in the house. They've been in this way for a long time. But they've got a couple of upgrades that, that the original crapper didn't have. If you notice, there's a trap where the water sits in the bottom so that gas can't get up into the house. That's where you see the bowl in the bottom of, of your toilet. And then there's the siphon as well. So that when the toilet fills up with a certain amount of water, the siphon draws a siphon, and that's where you get the big whoosh, you know, it goes down the drain. Notice also the big pipe back behind there, the vent pipe. You maybe wondered what that was in your house. That's to vent sewer gas out to the atmosphere. And your house is full of those vent pipes. Uh, every device in your house should have vent pipes, and if you look at the little pipe off to the side, those silly little pipes that come up from your roof in various places, those are sewer vent pipes, required by code in every house. And if you've got one that's, that's done wrong, you will smell it, a basement that's venting or something, you'll smell the sewer gas. Here's taking you out through the plumbing you own. When we talk about big infrastructure, we've got to realize that there's a huge infrastructure between the house and the street. For every house you see, there's a pipe between that house and the sidewalk, or out in the middle of the street, or wherever the, the plumbing is going through. And what this shows you here is that there can be a house that's nice and clean and everything plumbed correctly, or the one to the left that's got leaks in every conceivable way. And so the leakage is beginning in the system. What could possibly go wrong? Now you can look for leaks. The common way to do that is to put pressurized smoke into the lines, and then the vent pipes will shoot smoke, and your leaks will shoot smoke. And if you do that and they find smoke in your yard, you got to buy a pipe. And so if you look, most household pipe fixes five, six thousand bucks. So figure out how much that infrastructure is worth for every house on your street, for every house in the system. The number of miles of pipe out there are just as big from the house to the street as, they are, as the whole rest of the collection system. And that makes it really hard for big collection systems to operate and fill all that because the average homeowner doesn't fix this kind of stuff and it sits broken for years, leaking. Ah, this gets to John's laws of pipes. I've worked these out over many years and they're airtight, I'm telling you. Also applicable to pumps and treatment plants. All pipes leak. This is a given. You can make them, you can put them in tight the first time, but they will leak. Pipes are never the right size. They're always too big or too small, even at any special moment. We always use them wrong. So that's kind of the theme here. They leak, they're the wrong size, and then we use them incorrectly. So you'll see that pops up throughout. So let's start. Would you like one pipe or two with your sewage? So you can have combined sewers, or you can have separated sewers. Old cities are built with combined sewers. There's just one set of pipes, and all the storm water goes in there, and all the toilet water and sanitary water goes in there. So what happens is under dry weather conditions, it's just flowing along, and the pipe is actually too big. And then when you have a big storm, it overflows the pipe, and the pipe is too little. And so what happens is they're built with an overflow. The pipe will hold a certain amount of water up to some capacity, and then it is intentionally diverted into your stream. That's the way they built them in the old days. So it's an intentional leak built into the system. And they're designed, and they're called CSO outfalls, combined sewer outfalls. And there's uh, huge programs to work on that. I'll talk about that later. But just to let you know, there's two kinds of systems, separated and combined. Now, when you do collection systems, no matter what kind they're built at, there's some basics of how they're built. Water runs downhill. There's a calculated slope on how they run. If you make them too steep, they'll fire the water down too, too fast, can break stuff up under you know, high water events. 
Uh, old collection systems were often laid in streams, and so that was the death of a stream. So many times when you see the collection system under an old city, especially combined sewers, you're seeing the death of an old stream. Uh, collection systems follow the landscape. They follow the topo map. Because you're trying to get just that right slope in them, you try and parallel the slope of the hills going through town, and so you, follow, you find that your collection system kind of follows your old watershed. So if a guy like me who kind of knows how sewers work and I want to find my way down to the sewage treatment plant, I just follow downhill, following the landscape and the electricity. And collection systems do follow the landscape, but sometimes you run out a hill. You know, water runs downhill, but sometimes you won't run out a hill. So then you have to have lift stations to actually pump water up, and those cost money. So really, with this simple stuff, what I'm pointing out is that there's a huge hidden infrastructure, and it's expensive, and there's a lot of it. And so that's where we want to go. So I wanted to show you some of that infrastructure. Told you about uh, filling in a creek. Here's OK Creek, one of the oldest sewers in Kansas City, uh, filled in the creek, 1867. That interceptor sewer has been replaced many times, but still exists in that very place to this day. It was last done maybe 20 years ago, but a pipe exists in that very place today, still doing what it did then. Now, back in the old days, I talked about the great stench or the great stink. We don't realize that when you lived in a world where you just smelled filth, like constantly, getting a sewer was a form of having arrived. A big city, when they got a sewer, this was, this was a civic breakthrough. People raised money. The rich pitched in first. <laughs> and everybody was really glad. And when they finally got something built, well, here's an example, Waterloo, Iowa, they had a white tablecloth dinner in the storm sewer. So you get the idea. I mean, it, it looks hilarious to us now, but at that time, this was a form of proving that you were civilized and that you had become a real American city. Now, sewers are made of lots of things. They're made of bricks. Go to St. Louis and the city's just, city's made of bricks, but the sewers are certainly made of bricks. There are probably some old brick sewers around here. They come in all shapes and sizes. The Europeans were especially good at coming up with all these good configurations of sewers that would carry water at designed capacities and rates based on, on how much water was in the sewer. So you see these graphs with the curves, that was all engineered so that water would flow through them in very engineered ways. Concrete. This is, this is 60s. This looks very 60s or 70s. Notice it also looks like very much like the roadways up above you. And look at how much money is sitting in there. You look at what you spend on a highway project and realize that you built something just like that under the ground maybe 40 years ago. Maybe it's still working. Maybe we're keeping it up. But you can see the huge expense and size and scale. You can make anything better with asbestos. So in the old days, they made asbestos in concrete pipes, and they were known for their lightness. And they, two guys who could drop a pipe into a hole with, with ropes. So it allowed very quick building. So think the 50s and the 60s and suburbia popping up. Cheap light pipe, beautiful. Wood pipes, actually were used a lot in the old days. They leak a little bit. Clay pipes, that's very common in this part of the world. This is a picture from Johnson County, 1930s, I believe. And uh, you can see how clay pipe, we've all seen it, but uh, it's everywhere. It, it holds up forever. The stuff's pretty indestructible unless you just smash it with something. It leaks like a sieve. Here's some old ads for clay pipe. Here's William S. Dickey, one of the biggest clay pipe manufacturers was right here in Kansas City. His company had like 35 manufacturing locations all over the place, but Kansas City was the center of the clay pipe universe. And we bladed it like crazy under the city. And uh, Dickey was, was the big guy behind that. He was also very important environmentally. I may have mentioned this in my last talk, but his pipe, if I go back a slide, you can see you could buy perforated clay pipe. Dickey pipe was what drained much of the wetlands of Iowa and of southern Illinois. So if you want to look at one of the land, biggest land conversions, certainly on this continent, ranks on the planet, right up there with Chinese land conversions of the ancient times, Dickey clay pipe at work. Now looking at uh, inlets for stormwater. 
this is going back to combined or even separate sewers, but you've seen this on the street. So you've got a whole infrastructure of designed inlets, usually at the bottom of hills, every so often it's all engineered how many of them there are and how big of pipes they feed and all that stuff. There's a lot of thinking goes into that. There's also a lot of polluting that goes into that. If you notice, anything that goes in that storm sewer goes to the river. So anything you throw down the storm sewer, it can sewer it in the creek. And we've become more aware of that. You'll see labeling like that. But, you know, don't pour your waste oil down the, down the storm sewers. Um, be careful. You know, everything that fertilizer that's thrown on the street by accident goes right down the sewer. And as you can see, here's a picture on the left with the oil. Or you can see with uh, uh, the picture on the right at the bottom, you can see where they've picked up lots of clay and silt, and that's headed downstream. Now, manholes. We see them all the time, but they're actually what keeps the system working. Uh, manholes are placed at certain intervals, and what they do is they provide venting. I keep talking about venting, but that's a very important part of, of getting sewage to the, the plant. They also provide human access, so you can service the pipes. They put them in every so often, and uh, they can also serve as inlets. So manholes do a lot of things, and they're designed very specifically for certain purposes. And just to be really geeky about it, you can see that these are manholes from all over the world, and they design them. Sometimes cities have their own designs. Kansas City used to have its own designs, and there are people that actually, I'm sure there would be manhole collectors, but it's a little hard to carry one home on the plane. But uh, what you'll find if you go on uh, sewerhistory.org, you'll find a whole collections with people who have taken dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures of manhole covers, and they're pretty cool. I picked out the, just this set. Sewer maintenance. You remember the show, The Honeymooners? Trixie had this, this saying. He said, she said, you can take the man out of the sewer, but you can't take the sewer out of the man. Well, that's not quite right, because the truth is you got to have people servicing the sewers all the time. It's a big investment. It's a lot of work. So if you look here, you've got from the, the little end where you pay the guy to clean out your drain up to the big end where you've got somebody snaking out a sewer at scale. And you can see... This has been done for so long, you see a historical picture over 100 years old, Washington, D.C., lower left, and then you can see how it can be from maintenance, using trucks and vacuum and, and forced water right on up to having to dig up the streets. And if you complain about a $5,000 fix-it from your house to the street, thinks what it costs to dig up a whole street for a couple of blocks. We're talking real money almost. I talked about having to pump sewage uphill. Water runs downhill, but you run out of hill. So sometimes you have to lift water up, and it uses a lot of energy. So there are pumps. They're built with shutoffs and, and turn-on valves, and they can be of all different sizes, from a little sump pump in your house right on up to the big boys in big pump houses. In places like New Orleans, they've got pump houses where each pump would be 20-foot cube, huge, big boys. If you notice these things, you see these kinds of things all over the place. The, the gimme of where one of these is located, if you see it, they're seldom marked in any way. You'll see access doors so that they can pull pumps in and out of the hole. You'll also see big electrical boxes nearby. The bigger the pump, the more the electricity. So right away, once we've gotten, in, gotten into moving water around and taking water downhill and trying to get it to the, the plant, we're burning a lot of electricity. So you wonder where your bill goes. Uh, I did some calculations. Each person is, a, you know, your little part of the electrical bill of treating your wastewater is about a 60-watt bulb burning all the time. But when you put that all together into a system, wastewater plants are often the biggest user of energy, the biggest single customer in the system. I said pumps. Pumps come in all sizes and are super highly specialized. Uh, they've got things called pump curves, depending on what kind of pressure you're pumping, how fast they'll pump. And so each pump, there are people that get PhDs in pumps, and they go from very small kind of generic ones. You see these ones in a lift station. They actually must be in a warm climate because they're above ground. Up to the really big boys, look at the lower left. That's the kind of pump you'd find in a power plant or something like that. The pumps get mighty big. Now, when pumps get that big, they're incredibly specialized and incredibly engineered. Uh, you don't just buy one of those off the shelf. There may be only four or five of that pump in the whole world, and replacement part is sitting in Germany if it's, if it's there. And so when they do an impeller for a big pump like that, it's a special order, and 
Very pricey, hundreds of thousands of dollars for that fix. Big pumps can cost millions. So if you bust a pump, that's very expensive. And there is, there is great possibility in working pumps for operator error. So at the sewage treatment plant, pumps are kind of off limits to some guys, especially certain ones. Now, we use the pipes wrong. Inflow, hanging roof drains into the sewer system. You know, there's lots of ways where we have water inappropriately entering the system. Just plain old leaks. Pipes leak. I told you that they're leaky. Groundwater comes above the pipes, they leak. Rainwater pushes up the groundwater or trickles down and they leak. And one of the things you can see here, and this is very common in the business, is you shoot a camera down through the hole, figure out where the leaks are. And there are various tricks for tightening pipes up. There's things called slip lining, where you actually run a liner the size of the pipe down through. You put it in and deploy it by pressure, and then that lock gets locked in and kind of seals the pipe off. And there are various other methods. You can grout them in. Uh, it's a science unto itself, and it's a very imperfect science, but it's constant. Cities spend a big portion of their money working on I&I, &I, and it's just a constant fight for them. Something I'd point out, EPA used to think you could really fix these easy, and over the years we have found out that plugging the leaks isn't hard. John's Rules of Pipes, all pipes leak. So it's actually been kind of brought into the policy awareness is that, gee, pipes leak. Pipes are leak, and pipes are never the right size. There are overflows. During big rainfall events, the pipes can't keep up. So you could see a sewer, you know, see a manhole lid dancing. You can see uh, overflows at manholes in various places. Now, at the right, what you will see is an urban legend. It's called the Cherokee Street Geyser. What happens in St. Louis, there are some CSOs, and when they take a lot of flow, just that special storm, this thing just shoots up in the air about three stories. And uh, water and wastewater, rainwater and wastewater all mixed up. And it was an urban, you know, kind of an urban myth for many years. People had seen it, but no one had ever photographed it. And so like a couple years ago, well, there was a tattoo shop and a restaurant and a bunch of people with cell phones, and now they've got movies of it. You can find it in, in the Riverfront Times. Just look up Cherokee Street Geyser and you'll find movies. I talked about using pipes wrong and, and combined sewers, and I also talked about anything that goes down the sewer hits the stream. Here's examples of combined sewer overflows. I mentioned those intentional leaks. The one on the right, that's Kansas City. Okay, that's, that's down on the riverfront, Missouri River. That's one of ours. And the one on the upper left, I just wanted to have, show that picture to show you what kind of stuff can be hit in the river and just a bar grate to catch it, and any of the pollutants walked away. What they commonly have, too, is a flap gate. So the, the gate, when it's under pressure, lifts up and opens, and then under its own weight, it closes back down and seals the system when it's not under pressure. CSOs. Old, big, and many. I want to talk with you a little bit about Kansas City. 2,800, within the city limits, 2,800 miles of pipes. Now that's the pipes that are operated by the city utility. There's probably another 2,800 to 3,000 miles of pipes that are between houses and the curb, you know, that are owned by homeowners. So really the system is probably double that size. Of that, 260 square miles are separated sewer, but 56 square miles in the city are under CSOs. And some of those, parts of those systems date back to 1863. They're still some of the original sewers serving parts of the system. Stuff that breaks gets fixed, but it gives you some idea of the age of the system. And cities have trouble keeping up, and Kansas City was one of those that didn't keep up. And so when you see, you know, the complaints about your bridges and your infrastructure not keeping up and failing, Kansas City and many other cities are, are examples of this. And the, that secret, silent, sunk money infrastructure beneath the ground is the one we know the least about. And yet, really, in terms of our quality of life and human health, that's really important. Uh, EPA made a settlement with the city of Kansas City to do some, some work on the CSOs as well as the rest of the collection system. At $2.5 billion, that'll be spread over about 25 or 30 years. And these are big projects. You can store water in the pipes. You can do treatment. Uh, we're talking green infrastructure, gray infrastructure. There's an awful lot of moving parts there. That could almost be a, a talk unto itself. 
how does a treatment plant work? Well, you put a lot of energy into them. But here's a kind of a, a generic plant. Every plant's different. I've been in a lot of them. One of the things I've done through my jobs, I've got to visit more sewage treatment plants than probably anybody here. And uh, I've been on a lot of factory floors as well. That's been actually one of the one of the cool things about my job is I've been able to see a lot of the real world infrastructure and how it works and how it's engineered and get to walk around with plant engineers and talk with them about it and uh, see some interesting things out there. Uh, basically plants we talk secondary treatment. What that is is two processes. We have primary and then the secondary treatment process and a secondary clarifier. I'll go through these. This, this is how they draw it in the textbook, okay? Let's look at one in pictures. When you start at the front of a, a plant, you have a big bar screen up there. Everything that went down the sewer rolls down to the plant, especially at a CSO. So you find oil filters, car parts, softballs, basketballs, anything a kid can drop down the sewer, dead animals, leaves, debris, trash, plastic cups, everything that can get down into a sewer by flush or by a stream drain can turn up in the bar screen. And those are cleaned with big rakes. And I had one operator told me at a very large city, Omaha, that he actually found a car block on one once. Who would throw a car block down the... Now, oil filters, we knew where that one came from, but car block. Okay, then there's a thing called a grit chamber. Most plants have this. What it does is settles out the sand. And why do you do that? Well, you're running those big expensive pumps, right? Are you going to sandblast those expensive pumps? No, you settle out the grit so it won't tear up your plant, so it won't scour the pipes. And what it comes out with is a pretty much a sharp sand, a lot of broken glass, actually. And so that turns into grit. Primary treatment. This is really simple stuff here. Primary treatment is just catching the floaters of the sinkers. You slow the water way down, and uh, let's see if I, yeah. So you slow the water way down, stuff will settle out, floaters and grease will float to the top. It's a carefully designed thing. There's a collar at the middle that kind of stills things, keeps the water from short-circuiting across the top, so that's where the water comes in. Then it's real smooth water. You've got rakes on the bottom to clean off the sludge that you collect, and then that comes out. That's primary sludge. And then you've uh, got some scrapers on the top that are picking off the scum. That's going someplace else. And then you've got water going over the weir after it's settled for a little while. Actually, yeah, it gets about two-thirds of the pollution right there, and that first came to Kansas City as treatment in our mid-60s. Uh, back until then, we didn't treat. Now, activated sludge, what that is is a concentrated bacterial culture. How it works is it's an old technology. It's got old terminology. They think, you know, things like mixed liquor suspended solids and all this stuff that sounds like it's 100 years old, and it is. And so what they did was, uh, you know, they make up all kinds of mathematical models. I used to hate it when I was in school because I'd look at this math and say, how did they derive this? Well, they didn't. They made it up. It was a working model of how these processes worked in practice. So old school engineers kind of had a cheat sheet is how it worked. There are many versions. What it does is a big bacterial culture that eats small particles and soluble foods. So you, you got the big stuff with primary, and now you gun up a big bacterial culture that sits around and eats the rest of the nutrients as best they can out of, out of the, the sewage. Small footprint, so they're big in cities, or they're useful in cities because of their compact size. Energy intensive. Boy, do they eat. If you think of how much gas you can spend dragging a boat around, well, figure riling up that much water at that level. And then what you're doing is you're building up organisms, you're recycling them back into the system, and then you've got this biological culture there. I've shown a picture up at the center there that's sitting there just eating as fast as it can go. You're providing it with that perfect biological thing of food, water, and air. And so that's, and, and the solids to attach to. There's a thing called an oxidation ditch where you pump the water in circles using uh, these, these rotors. And they kind of work the same way. You're recycling sol solids back. They just don't, uh, they're made to work very flat. They work well in floodplains. You see them a lot in Missouri in floodplains. They're also pretty energy, they're better energy savers than the regular activated sludge. 
There's a thing called a trickling filter. That's where you drop down through some kind of a media and it gets wet, it gets a slime growth on it, and that's how it builds up its growth and you recycle the water over it many times. Very much an energy hog. They used to use them in the old days, but every time you pick up that water, you spend all that energy picking it up, drop it, picking it up, drop it. So by the time you run water through that thing, nine, 10 passes, you've picked that water up over 100 feet of, of elevation over time. Very expensive to do that. Uh, they're also sometimes plagued with, with uh, flies, known as filter flies, or they can get snails. You know, your aquarium snails go down the drain, finally make it to the trickling filter, and then they'll grow like mad in a trickling filter. So I've seen plants just totally infested with these snails, and it just, I would say it's comical, unless you're the operator. Okay, I told, told you how we run through and eat a lot of stuff, and then we capture a sludge. And this secondary clarifier is just like the first one. It's just dropping the floaters and the sinkers out of a more, uh, out of a uh, better cleaned water. I said that they're energy intensive. At the other end of the stick, you can have systems that are very energy, ener low energy. And that's a lagoon. So you see these out in more rural areas. They don't treat quite as well, but they have very long detention times. You take a mechanical plant, the water's in there all the six or eight hours. It doesn't spend a lot of time in the plant removing all those pollutants. Here you're looking at detention times, 120 days, 180 days. So lagoons are kind of the slow motion version of this process. They're great for energy because you don't use any. They work on gravity and they live forever and they die slow. They may not be as good a treatment as high end mechanical stuff, but they do work and especially at small scale. That's really important in our region where a lot of our towns are just three and 400 people. So if you look by gallons treated, that's dominated by big mechanical plants, simple as that, big cities. But if you look at the number of facilities across the landscape, about 80% of our facilities by number are these little baby lagoons serving everything from the barbecue joint to you know a trailer park to a small town. I talked about bacteria and there's disinfection. A lot of facilities use disinfection and there are a couple of methods. You can use chlorine. When you use chlorine, that's a very toxic stuff. Uh, you then put it in so that it has a detention time. So that uh, little deal you see, the, uh, the labyrinth there up to the upper right, that's just holding the water in long enough so the chlorine can kill everything. And then you add chemicals back to dechlorinate because otherwise that wa wastewater would be toxic going into the stream. Just like plain old tap water can uh, Kill your guppies when you bring them home in it. Same works with the chlorinated water out, out of uh, discharge. There's also ozone, once again energy efficient, seldom used, and uh, UV, also pretty heavy energy user, and uh, that's used fairly commonly, but it does take, take a lot of upkeep. Outfalls, I've never seen a pretty one, but I've seen many. Uh, this is the place where the water comes out. You're often looking at you may have had 95% reduction of pollutants from the headworks, but it's still always ugly stuff. Uh, I've seen a few plants that turn out some, some really high quality effluents, but that tends to be the, the modern, very mechanical, advanced plants. And by the way, we're getting better at that. Uh, there's been some major breakthroughs now where the, the quality of effluents come up a lot and doing so with less energy. So the design of plants, especially when we've got computer design and all that in place, is doing much better. So what could go wrong? Well, at a plant and in the system, mechanical electrical failure, computer failure. Uh, plants are run by computers now. It's called SCADA systems. So guys run computer, you know, run plants off of secure computer systems called SCADA. Uh, operator error absence. Small town, nobody's there on Friday night when the plant malfunctions, see you Monday morning. Uh, upset, plants get sick. If you plant, drop the right pollutant down in the right amounts, you can upset a plant, you upset that biological process, they cough up stuff and then they're very unhappy and they don't treat well. There's a thing called hydraulic shock. Oh, wait, pass through? Uh, that's what happens when a plant cannot treat a waste. I told you that they eat very certain things, they eat waste. Well, things like water solubles, like dropping, dropping meds down the toilet, you might as well have thrown them in the river. Uh, you take pesticides, drop it down the drain, Sewage treatment plants don't touch that. You might as well have thrown it in the river. So there are a lot of water-soluble things that are pollutants 
that, you know, that we think of, as especially meds and pesticides, that kind of thing, that people drop down the drain and they, they go straight to the river. The removal by the treatment plant is incidental. So hydraulic shock, you can shoot too much water through a plant. During a rain, they can, you can actually blow them out. And there's organic shock, high strength waste. You hook up the new dairy to the plant, the plant goes crazy. Corrosion, we talked about sewer gas, that'll really eat pipes, especially old iron ones. Concrete too. You think concrete's pretty tough stuff until you expose it to mild acid, tears it up. So H2S and the sewer gas gets it. And there can be explosions. I got these pictures, this, uh, the one lower middle, Louisville, Kentucky, a CSO going down the hill. Some guys dumped some solvents into the, the plant. It flashed, boom, dropped about a mile of street into the hole. Same thing happened with gasoline. These are Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, sewer gasoline dumped down, a, down created uh, fumes, lower explosive level, ba-boom. So it dropped the whole thing and dropped the street in the, in the hole for miles. Now you capture all this pollutant, it's got to go someplace, sludge handling. Sludge can be processed, it can be used beneficially as a fertilizer on farms if you've controlled your heavy metals and controlled your disease and vectors. But it's, I told you that all the money in the infrastructure is in the collection system. A lot of your operating expenses is making sludge go to land. Here in Kansas City, there's a big farm, uh, well over 100 acres where the sludge is applied. 100, I think it may be over 1,000. I'd have to go look, it's big. And so sludge can be incinerated, landfilled, or processed, and then the land applied. Most of the sludge in our region is land applied. Any questions? The poop and the president too And the fancy grand banker in his three-piece suit The big fat general and all of his troops The truth of the matter is everybody poops The famous brain surgeon has to lead his lump And the high-priced model has to stop for a dump But can the size of Canada can't spray away the truth Cause even if they don't admit it, everybody poops Everybody poops Everybody poops Sure things number more than two Death and taxes and everybody poops Some days it's easy, other days it's hard But if your system's working, they your lucky stars Nobody talks about it, not a word is said if you're not pooping, then it means you're probably dead. The destitute and homeless have to do it, it's true. But even all the wealthy people gotta make do. And if you live long enough, it's happening to you. Sooner or later, everybody poops. Everybody poops. Everybody Everybody moves, F and taxes and everybody